Well, it's Resurrection or Easter Sunday, so happy Easter to all of you out there. Hopefully you're enjoying this time and worship services, also with family. Well, you know, the General Assembly is over, but we're looking at the laws that have been passed. Joining us today to talk about what took place in the General Assembly, what laws are taking effect in your district, we have with us Delegate Benita Anthony, representing District 92 and Norfolk State University. Only on Stay the Water. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Laville. We'll be right back in just a moment. Welcome back at Stay the Water. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Laville. Once again, we want to thank you for joining us on this beautiful Sunday, as you always do, as we broadcast from the campus of the Norfolk State University, home of the Spartan Nation, from none other than WNSB Hot 91, the Soul of VA. Well, you know, this is a very special Sunday because it is Resurrection Sunday or Easter Sunday. So once again, we hope you hopefully you're enjoying your time in worship uh, in your assemblies and also with family. I would like to also give a shout out to the Spartan men's basketball team for winning the College Insider postseason tournament. They are once again champions. Once again, hats off and congratulations to Coach Jones and also the Spartan men for a phenomenal season well deserved. And of course also the women's basketball team who won not only regular season but also won the tournament, MEAC tournament and represented well in California in playing number two Stanford as the number 15 seed. So once again, congratulations to our student athletes, our AD and of course our great leadership, our president, Dr. Javon Adams Gaston and everyone that had a major part in ensuring that we are once again champions. Well, again, for those of you who have been joining us, you know that the session is over, bills are signed and we are looking to see what's going to take effect July 1st. That's going to help to, in part, control and dictate our lives, laws and public policy. That's what we're about here. As a matter of fact, the governor just this past week took action on 107 bills. He vetoed seven and passed 100. And we're going to talk about some of those bills that he vetoed and some bills that he passed and his tour that he's talking about with the backwards budget. But we're going to have that conversation with who I, I, I love, who is, is representing our district here in Norfolk State University, my friend, and someone who is truly, truly a servant leader, none other, other than Delegate Benita Anthony. Delegate Anthony, how are you this morning? I'm well. Good morning to you. Good morning. I'm happy to be here. Absolutely. And listen, I know that this Easter, I know that you've enjoyed Resurrection Sunday at your assembly and and all of, all of that good stuff. The great things that you and your assembly do in the community. Hats off to you and we applaud you for that. Again, a true servant leader. You know, when, when we talked and it seems just like yesterday uh, <laughs> that you were running yeah. for office. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yes. You're running for office, yes. knocking Seems doors. Like and I probably was, <laughs> you know, according to this accelerated timeline that we're on here. Right. <laughs> you know, you're running for office, knocking doors, going to this this meeting, this meeting, this fundraiser, that fundraiser. And then all of a sudden, bam, you're in Richmond and you are representing District 92, which encompasses the Norfolk State University. You know, so tell us a little bit about, you know, how was that, you know, your first legislative session? Oh, my goodness. It's been a whirlwind, but I am so grateful, so grateful to God that I get to do this work. Um, and you're right. It's like, bam, you're, you're thrown into it. Immediately, you have to start working. Um, as soon as the election was over, we were, you know, headfirst into making sure that we gathered the information that we have, you know, have listened to our constituents, our, our, you know, people in our district, our neighbors, our family members, and started working, uh, crafting legislation, getting trained on how to navigate through the legislative process um, and what's that going to look like during session. It was definitely a journey. Um, it's, you know, I'm grateful that, you know, I was able to be a part of this historic year um, for the Virginia General Assembly with our first Black Speaker of the House, Speaker Don Scott. 
our first black woman majority leader, Leader Herring, um, our first black chair of appropriations, yes, and our first black Senate chair of finance and, and appropriations, our first woman of color chair of the Democratic Caucus. We have a historic freshman class of 34 new members uh, from various backgrounds who are ready you know, to go for it and to go into this session and represent our communities and to keep Virginia moving forward. You know, again, Virginia moving forward. And one thing about it, you mentioned the leadership, you know, the new leadership of the General Assembly. This is, you know, it, let's just say it's, it's a great time to be a part of the General Assembly. You know, if you're going to run for office, this was the time to do it because of the historic nature of what we experience, you know, you mentioned all the leadership from Don Scott, first African American Speaker of the House, to Senator Lucas, the uh, Delegate Harry, uh, first yeah. Majority Leader. I mean, it's just so many firsts, but not just so many firsts, but what took place in the General Assembly. You know, I, I've, I've I've been watching this and been involved in politics for over over two decades, uh, but for for the Commonwealth over 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 a decade. And this is really the first session I saw Democrats and Republicans have so much in common. You know, how, 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 what were you expecting something different? And, and what was your take on how you guys work well together on a lot of, not all issues, <laughs> but, but okay, not all issues now. But not on every issue. Not on every uh, issue. I, I, <laughs> not, not, definitely not on every issue. But, um, I, I, you know, I think, uh, you know, people, uh, you know, had their thoughts on how the session was going to go. Uh, and we went in there. Uh, I, I don't know if we had any preconceived notion of, of how things were going to go. We just kind of went in there and said, okay, we're ready to work. Um, and like I said, we have a historic freshman class. All of us came in there uh, charged and ready to go and to represent our districts well. Our Democratic caucus, we were united. We were very strategic. We stayed the course and fulfilled our fiduciary responsibility to the, t- to the point where we ended on time. We adjourned on March 9th at 5 p.m., a little over 5 p.m., adjourned on time. We, we, have a, we had a balanced, structurally sound budget, and it was bipartisan support. So we, we believe that, of course, it's important to build relationships uh, because all of us at the very core, you know, have some things in common that we're, you know, that we're, you know, we want our families to be well taken care of. We care about our, our friends. We care about our neighbors. We care about our communities. And so um, I, that's why I believe that we walked away with a very sound budget with bipartisan support because of that. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people have preconceived notions that it's going to be a battle, you know, and <laughs> all, although some issues, it was a battle, right? <laughs> right, right. And, I mean, and, uh, it was definitely a battle. There's definitely some spiritual warfare going on in the background, you know, lots of prayer. <laughs> absolutely. Oh God, but yeah. You know, one thing I want to also say that, and I, this is just as a as just an observation. I attended the swearing in of a lot of a lot of the members, of course, attended your swearing in. And one thing I found very unique about your your swearing in and your taking of oath of office is that you started with prayer, <laughs> you know, oh my God. you know, prayer and also worship, you know, and, and it, it, was, it was a magical moment. You know, it was a God moment in the house, you know. We reflect a little bit about, you know, why it was so important to really start it that way. Uh, it was, of course, it was very important to start with prayer because it's, you know, uh, because we can't do anything without God, right? And so I, I appreciate uh, my pastor, Dr. Sharon Riley, who cracked open that chamber atmosphere with prayer. And I remember everyone within the chamber who was sitting at various members' desks, and I told them that to take the name of the person of the desk that they were sitting at and that they were responsible for praying over that particular member. It didn't matter whether they knew it was a Democratic member or a Republican member. Uh, It didn't matter. They they were responsible for praying for that particular member throughout session, not only praying for that member, but praying for their families and praying for their well-being because this is important work. And so we are doing the work for the people of the Commonwealth of Virginia. So definitely 
it was uh, worth starting off with prayer first thing. Absolutely. Moving on, we took a you know, every year we have an opportunity to bring our students and our administrators and our stakeholders, our alumni to campus. I mean, to, to camp from campus to Capitol Hill. And we call yeah. it NSU Day on the Hill, you know, and that's the time where we get a chance to advocate for NSU with us being your largest constituent <laughs> in your district. Yeah. You know, tell us a little bit about how NSU Day on the Hill really impacted what you were advocating for for us. It was it was awesome to see NSU on the hill. Um, I am fortunate enough that to that the 92nd district um, has four higher education institutions apart. Not only Norfolk State University, we have the TCC Norfolk campus. Um, we also have Eastern Virginia Medical School, including Old Dominion University as well. And so uh, it was very important being an educator myself. I. <laughs> you know, represent higher ed, uh, spent most of my education career in higher ed. It was very important to see Norfolk State University on the Hill um, bringing forth their priorities and for us working towards those priorities to make sure that public education was take well taken care of, particularly in the budget and any type of issues that are surrounding Norfolk State University uh, and the students and the staff that we make sure that we advocate and do well by our constituents. So very happy uh, to see Norfolk State always, always, always love to see um, the green and gold up there. Absolutely. And we love the fact that you're representing us and the work that you're doing there. It's Stay the Water. I'm your host, Dr. Clavel. You're joining us for our Looking Back, Looking Forward 2024 General Assembly Review, where we're talking with legislators, delegates and senators and members and leaders of our General Assembly to discuss what took place and what we have to look for July 1st when the new laws take effect. Joining us, we have with us none other than my good friend and a phenomenal advocate for Norfolk and who represents Norfolk State University Delegate Benita Anthony representing District 92. So let's talk money. <laughs> sure, yeah, let's talk money. Yeah, let's talk money. So it's all about the budget. I mean, we have we had like over 25, almost 3000 bills that were pre-filed. And with the pre-filing the bills, of course, many with many, you know, didn't make it. And we have a we have a few hundred that made it through. And with that, you know, the biggest thing that we look at every two years here in the Commonwealth of Virginia is the budget. So the budget bill. Yes. <laughs> so we, I mean, is, we're talking billions of dollars. And, and when we're talking billions of dollars, everybody comes out to woodworks. Right. Just to, to get right. the little piece of the pie. And, you know, some pieces are bigger than others, <laughs> you know, but yeah. everybody wants their piece of the pie. So we've got two factions. We got two different tours taking place here in the Commonwealth. The governor is touring on the backwards budget, saying that this budget is not good for Virginia and is just not conducive uh. for the future. But the leadership of the General Assembly, uh, including yourself, are touring on Virginia's family first budget. Let's break it down. Why do you think the governor's touring on the backwards budget and what makes the budget passed by General Assembly Virginia's family first? Listen, uh, so like I said before, you know, we not only did we end the session on time, we ended it with a balanced, structurally sound budget with bipartisan support. Um, it was a, a historic budget where we made tremendous investments in public education. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we secure our children's future through a world-class education, um, through the biennium, which is, you know, the, our two-year budget, by investing in our educators, investing in our students, investing in our schools. And we want to bring down the cost of living. You know, we want to make sure that Virginia's working families are taken care of, that we can go to the store and purchase groceries and, and put gas in our vehicles and, and be able, uh, you know, to, uh, to have good medical care for our families. And we want to improve access to health care and create more opportunities for families to thrive. So we produced a budget that exemplified our values, Virginia's families first. 
So I am, I am honored to be able to be a part um, of this General Assembly who put forth this particular budget. And right now, you know, moving forward, we, you know, of course, um, you know, we have ended session, but right now the governor, you know, has until April 8th um, to sign over 1,300 pieces of legislation. Of course, you know, he's reviewed some, he's amended some, he's vetoed a number of things. Um, and we go back for reconvene, or what people usually call the veto session, on April 17th. Um, and then, you know, we have to work out HB 30, which is a proposed budget, and making sure, because the governor, he can do some line item amendments to that budget. Um, and then that budget has to be signed by July 1st. And so we have uh, a long road ahead of us, um, you know, here in Virginia, and so we're hoping uh, that we don't go backwards, that we keep Virginia moving forward, and that we continue to uh, make sure that Virginia's working families are taken care of. Absolutely. Now, I want to get into some of the legislation that you champion and passed and what it really means for you know, your district, also the people in the, uh, the Commonwealth and African Americans. But before we do that, I want to talk about one aspect of the budget, and that's education. Now, the General yeah. Assembly, that was that, that was this little study that came out called from the JLARC. Which is, yeah, which is so the J- that, that little study from, <laughs> oh, yeah, the, the JLARC study, yes. Yeah, that JLARC study, which basically is a, is a joint legislative uh, uh, entity now that basically, yeah. you know, by, by the legislature says, hey, you know, I want you to take a look at this. And they do a bipartisan study, just the facts, just the facts. And just the facts. And what that showed, it showed that we, as Virginians, we do not fund our K-12 through public schools right. You know, we, right. We, you know, we want... <laughs> Right. You know, we we want our students to be the best. We talk about they're the best. But when it comes down to it, we're not funding them the way that it should be. Tell us a little bit about the funding, how the legislature, you and the legislature leadership looked at that study and how you decided to say, hey, we're going to fund education the right way. So, look, it's important for us to to use data uh, to, you know, back up any pieces of legislation or any budget amendments that we put forward. Uh, we just can't pull things from the top of our head, which we found some of our, our colleagues, you know, tried to bring forth legislation that they pulled out of nowhere. Um, but it was very important to take a look at that study for us to use data, um, not just raw data, but anecdotal data, um, and to make sure that we make good decisions. You know, and of course, it showed that we were not investing um, in public education um, to the point where, you know, we had to do something about it. And so uh, not only did we put forth several pieces of legislation that was suggested by the JLARC study, but we made tremendous investments by, uh, you know, the 3% raise in teacher pay for each fiscal year in, in the biennium and, you know, putting forth, you know, over $1.2 billion more dollars in, in investing in public education and the general fund and, and making sure that, you know, we have all the resources and even putting forth legislation that allow localities to make decisions um, about, you know, school construction and infrastructure, um, because, you know, particularly in, you know, the 92nd district, we have schools that are falling apart, that need, we need new buildings, we, uh, the HVAC system, we got mold, we got everything, got asbestos, trying to mitigate all those issues and making sure that our, our children have safe learning environments and our teachers are not impacted um, by the environment in which they work every day. Um, so, you know, we, we led with our values in, in public education. And one particular um, piece of legislation that I sponsored was um, on workforce development for um, our young people. Um, one of them was HB 1345, um, which is going uh, to head it to the governor's desk, uh, where, you know, looked at the high school graduation requirements and allow students to use workforce credentials that they earn outside of the classroom and being able to reverse articulate those, uh, those credentials 
to use them for elective credits towards graduation. So uh, case in point, there uh, were a group of students that had a packed schedule. So we know that high school students, you know, their their day-to-day school schedules are packed with, you know, their courses, their AP classes, and so forth. So we had a group of students who went outside of class at nighttime and earned their EMT certification. And so they wanted to, you know, reverse articulate that and earn elective credit towards graduation. And so there was not a mechanism in code to do that. So that, that was something that we partnered with. Uh, with career technical education and with some industry partners to make sure that we did the right thing and making sure that students had an opportunity. It gives industry as well an opportunity to fund more opportunities for students to earn credentials if they can't earn it during during the school day or have, you know, a room in their schedule to, to insert those types of, of programming and so that we can still keep moving. Virginia is moving forward. We don't have a brain drain in our area. Mm-hmm. We used to have not only students earning, you know, college um, uh, degrees, but also workforce credentials in our area as well. So very proud of that. Hopefully, you know, uh, the governor hasn't done anything with that particular bill. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah, you know, of course, 1,300 pieces of legislation to review. Uh, but the governor can do one of four things. He can, you know, can sign it and it goes into law. He can amend it and then we review it. And then when we come back, when we convene, we can, you know, either accept the amendments or reject them. Or you can veto them, which he's done already with important pieces of legislation. Or if he doesn't, do anything with and he doesn't sign it by the deadline, it still goes into law. That's right. Um, so, yeah. So <laughs> there we are. You know, that that is the process of democracy, right? You know, uh, yeah. you know, democracy, but it's the public policy. It's the policy. It's, it's I like to say the devil's in the details. <laughs> you know, right. that, that's where the real power lies in understanding the details. You know, what what you mentioned with workforce development, I mean, that's a game changer because, you know, I'm this is just me. This is me talking. You know, when we look yeah. at our K-12, through I think the last two years of high school can really be used more efficiently and effectively where we actually have students who are going straight to college, you know, start to prepare that route, or students yeah. that want to get work experience and certifications while they're in school. So when they come out of school, they're job ready. And can yeah. and can you know really start to make a living for themselves? So absolutely. So hats off to you for really championing uh, that particular piece of legislation. You know, I, I want to talk about one piece of legislation that the well. I, before I do that, thank you again, also legislature, uh, for putting in money for HBCUs and higher ed. You know, Nor- yeah. Norfolk State. You know, really. Norfolk uh, State. Yeah. As it relates to higher ed and capital, you know, the governor didn't put anything in the budget for capital for anybody. Uh, but the legislature said we see the need for infrastructure. You mentioned infrastructure with K through 12. Yeah. You know, as opposed to lab schools on the governor's side, you know, but you, right. you said NSU needs infrastructure. So capital wasn't put into the budget and passed unanimously across the board in the House and the Senate. So thank you for funding HBCUs. Thank you for funding higher yeah. ed, you know, at the level, because we can't just stop at K through 12, but we got to take it to the we next just level. We can't stop at K through 12. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so um, the whole gamut of public education. Absolutely. And I want to take a look at one piece of legislation that the governor vetoed. Now, this came out uh, just this week. You know, he said, just this I'm, week. I'm vetoing bills that would implement drastic wage mandates, raise costs on families and small businesses, jeopardize jobs and fail to recognize regional economic differences across Virginia. In other words, he vetoed the House and the Senate bill, House Bill 1, Senate Bill 1, which mandates an increase in minimum wage in Virginia. He says the free market for salaries and wages works. Now, one thing about this, this was the very first bill that the House and Senate implemented. Right. Very the first very bill. first bill. Yes. It said families first. We're going to increase the minimum wage. Continue moving forward with what happened in the uh, northern administration. But the governor said and this would have been fifteen dollars an hour mandate, you know. So at fifteen dollars an hour, 
we the legislature said we believe that families need this, but the governor said free market works. What's your take on the governor vetoing the very first bill from the House and the Senate, which would put more money in working families' pockets? My goodness. I mean, so apparently, you know, that that is the the backward nature of our governor who, you know, does not believe, you know, in making sure that hardworking Virginians are taken care of. And so, you know, our, you know, our bipartisan budget, it invests in invest in workers and in the future of our economy for hardworking Virginians. We wanted to get closer to that $15 minimum wage. Uh, you know, and we also put in the budget that, you know, guaranteed eight weeks of paid leave. And we want to make sure that everyone um, in Virginia is, is covered. And so uh, I, I'm, I'm just appalled by um, that backward um, mentality of our governor um, and where you don't want to take care of the regular working person, but, you know, instead want to make sure the upper echelon or the upper 1% um, gets tremendous tax breaks. And so in our budget, we made sure that we invest in our, our hardworking um, families and our communities. Uh, we made sure that we put some correction to our upside down tax code. I'm fortunate enough to also be a part of the finance committee, um, you know, where, you know, we, you know, made sure that we don't have um, you know, we protected ratepayers. We protected people from having to pay 21 more percent in in sales and use taxes. Um, and we expanded our tax base. You know, according to the budget's first proposal back in December, so uh, so that we could invest more in public education. So uh, we, you know, our budget definitely keeps Virginians. You know, working families first, um, and I'm very proud uh, of, of the General Assembly and the work that we've done. And so we're going to keep, you know, putting forth um, our communities first. Um, and you know, that is the we legislate through our value, and we value um, our communities. We value hardworking Virginians. We value um, everywhere here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Absolutely. Well, speaking of valuing the Commonwealth and your your district. You know, the, the session is over, but what many people don't understand that that doesn't mean that you stop working. <laughs> <You know? laughs> we do not stop working. So, so, yeah, so not only are we, like, you know, making sure that, you know, we um, have, you know, uh, um, um, going forth and we convene, we are you know, working with the district at the same time session was going on. We had to address constituent issues. Um, you know, many of our constituents are contacting us um, and we are, you know, making sure that we are good servant leaders and making sure that we address the needs of our constituents. We're going to be in the communities. We're going to be doing uh, meeting various folks, various um, stakeholders, various community groups um, and, and listening to what, what's happening in everyday and people's everyday lived experiences. Um, you know, going to civic league meetings, to uh, community organizations, um, and, you know, meeting people where they are, you know, having, you know, various um, events that we attend where we get to talk with folks directly. We're going to be knocking some doors as well, you know, just kind of making sure that we keep on the pulse of what's going on. We are not far removed from you know, what is happening um, to people's everyday lived experiences. We are citizen legislators. We live in the district in which we represent. So what impacts, um, you know, our neighbors impacts us, of course. And so, you know, we make, want to make sure that we begin to develop legislation, um, you know, for next session and also to, you know, rally up um, all of our, our, our neighbors and our registered voters to make sure that they vote every year. We have, uh, you know, Virginia has elections every single year. And so it's very important that we keep everyone motivated. It's important that, you know, who we place in office and it's, you know, just to make sure that we are taken care of. And so I just, the work never ends. <laughs> uh, just because session over, we are, session's over, we are still out there. We're still in the community. We're still listening. And this is the time to share with us 
um, any pieces of legislation that you want us to put forward for next session for 2025. Absolutely. Again, the definition of a public servant. Delegate Benita Anthony, representing District 92 and Norfolk State University. Listen, thank you again so much for joining us on this Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday. And again, thank you for the work that you do in the community, for NSU, and for the people of the Commonwealth. Thank you so much. And as always, thank you for joining us here on Stay the Water, where we bring movers, shakers, and policymakers to you to discuss issues important to the community. Until next time, we'll see you next week. Be good, be great. God bless. Hi, I'm Carrie Washington, and you're listening to State of the Water with award-winning host, Dr. Eric Claville.